All right, guys. Uh, good afternoon. As uh, Tom introduced, I am Ping Hu. I work with Tom in his lab as a postdoc fellow. So today I'm going to bring you the lecture titled uh, "The G Protein Second Messengers and the Cholera." So let's first begin with cholera. The disease doesn't seem like a really uh, dangerous disease right now, but uh, like about 200 years ago, it was so deadly. So this is an uh, actual. A uh, poster that uh, um, from a small town of England, Dudley. So back then, it had a pretty bad cholera outbreak, and uh, it killed so many people that uh, the town eventually ran out of space to bury the new dead people. So it actually asked new dead people to be buried to the next to a town next to Dudley. So. Um, this is uh, give you an impression about how dangerous the cholera was. So, what is cholera actually? So, it is a symptom behaved like a severe diarrhea, and is caused by a waterborne bacteria named the Vibrio cholerae. So, uh, this bacteria kind of contaminate local water resources, and it produces a toxin. Named uh, cholera toxin, and uh, later on we will know this toxin can do some pretty bad things to your G protein, and it will eventually lead to a symptom of a severe diarrhea, and uh, it can transmit and contaminate multiple water resources. And uh, back then, it's difficult to identify the resource and difficult to control the disease, and uh, unfortunately, because it kills so fast. It's uh, cholera toxin actually is developed as a kind of biochemical weapon by multiple nations. So let's take a closer look about to see why cholera is so dangerous and so fatal. So as we know that um, normal people, like for men, we have like a four thousand millimeter of blood. For women, about a, a little bit less than three thousand millimeter. And about more than 95% of your blood actually just pure water. And uh, in case of a severe diarrhea, which in case you will lose a huge amount of water out of your blood. So it's not like you are losing your blood. You are not losing any red blood cells or white blood cells, but you are losing just uh, water, which actually will make your, uh, your total blood volume a lot kind of decreased drastically. And in the end, the people can become uh, hypotensive, which means their uh, blood pressure is so low, the heart of the people will not be able to provide enough blood to, its, uh, to his uh, vital organs. And it eventually will uh, lead to death. And normally, uh, without proper treatment, cholera can kill people normally within two to twelve hours, and sometimes it can kill just uh, within several hours. How to kind of uh, treat cholera? It's simple, because your disease actually, the only reason it kills you is it leads to severe dehydration. So just drink more water, clean water in this case. So it, normally people can make a fully recovery if it's uh, kind of uh, rehydrated in time. So again, just I mentioned previously, uh, the disease is caused by the bacteria Viborium uh, cholerae, and the toxin is produced, cholera toxin, a G protein modifier. So why this can actually cause the deadly uh, symptom, we will see later on in this lecture. <coughs> but first, let's learn what is actually a G protein. So from this um, cartoon, we can see that uh, the X with this circle is actually a uh, extracellular ligand. It binds to a group, uh, a protein, a cell surface receptor named the G protein coupled receptor. That's where it's called GPCR. And the receptor, because it's coupled with G protein, actually, so this region, this uh, trimeric protein complex made by R, beta, and gamma subunits. It's called G protein. Why is it called so? Because it's a, a protein that can actually hydrolyze GTP into GDP. So it's called GTP, 
uh, it's called a G protein. And uh, once the ligand, this yellow sphere, interact with the G protein coupled receptor, it can cause conformational change, the shape change of the protein, and then will transmit the signal from outside of cells to inside of cells and trigger a series of downstream signaling event. So like it will cause change of uh, associated G protein and make G protein, especially G alpha subunit, to undergo another round of uh, conformational change, making it to capable to be bound by a small molecule, GDP, GTP. And once it's bound by GTP, it's activated. And now it can move away from uh, its beta and gamma subunits. So you can notice here that the G alpha subunit is actually attached to the lipid membrane. So it can kind of lateral diffuse, so make it slightly easier to find its downstream effector, as a new cyclase, which is also attached to the plasma membrane. So once this enzyme in contact with the G alpha subunit, it can convert ATP into cyclic AMP, which in this class we will learn it is a second messenger. And we will be able to see a lot of other second messengers later on. So after a certain amount of time, remember that uh, G protein is actually a GT pace. So it can hydrolyze GTP into GDP. So after it has done that, it will return to its inactive form and uh, reform a complex with um, beta and gamma subunit. So kind of back to what everything started. And for all these um, excessive CMP, it will be kind of uh, digested <coughs> by an enzyme. First of all, diesterase. Otherwise, you, if you have too many of these molecules floating around, you kind of saturate the system, and the cell will not be able to properly respond to environment stimuli or changes. So this is a not horribly uh, complicated or difficult process, but uh, uh, we can actually make it a little bit simpler. So just think that uh, uh, you are having a dinner inside a, restru a restaurant, and uh, your order is actually the ligand. So the waiter or waitress is a G-protein coupled receptor. So it carries your order to a kitchen system, kitchen assistant, the G-protein. And the G-protein will then, the assistant will then bring your order to the chef, the enemy cyclist. And the, the chef now can cook, can produce ATP covered into CAMP. And in case that too many food made, but not enough got sold, so you have a kind of dumpster. In this case, in a cell, it's called phosphodiol is diesterase, and it can get rid of all these, you know, excessive food or excessive CMP. Just make things neat and clean for next round of you know new customers. So right, let's take a closer look at the structure, the crystal structure in this case of G protein. So as we can see right now, actually we should be able to play it, but uh, for some reason the cartoon will not play it. So uh, uh, anyway, so let's take a closer look at the crystal structure. So what we can see is that the red structure, this subunit, is a G protein alpha subunit, and the green beta subunit and the blue gamma subunit. So if you take a closer look, that's a tiny yellow pocket here. This is where GTP combines to G alpha subunits and activate it. And uh, another image, uh, another crystal structure here is actually showing uh, associated G protein with G protein coupled receptor. So this golden region, this uh, seven, uh, transmembrane domain, uh, transmembrane <coughs> membrane domain protein is actually the receptor. It's pretty bulky, and uh, this is uh, again the alpha subunit, beta subunit, and gamma subunit. So once the um, G protein receptor receives a signal from outside, bound by a ligand, it undergo conformational change, cause subsequent conformational change of a subunit of G alpha. And then it can be activated. 
All right, any questions so far? All right, let's move on. So why CAMP or cyclic AMP is so important? So why we really care about it? So the reason is that uh, CAMP actually uh, is a cofactor that activate a kinase named protein kinase A. So this, on the right side of the slide, you can see the structure of protein kinase A. So it's actually a tetramer, which means it contains four um, subunits. So two of the subunits are catalytical subunits, which means they can actually bind and uh, phosphorylate its substrate. Normally, uh, just a protein with uh, like a serine or serine or tyrosine uh, residues, and it can add a phosphate group to the hydroxyl group of those uh, side chains. And uh, there are another two subunits of this uh, tetramer. It's uh, actually regulatory, which means they are normally bind to the catalytic subunit and inhibit its activity. So it will not be able to uh, phosphorylate anything. However, once the CMP available, each regulatory subunit will be bound by two CMP molecules and uh, the binding will trigger again, kind of a conformational change and release the inhibition that previously uh, brought by the, uh, by the regulatory subunits upon the catalytic subunit. And then after the inhibition got released, the protein kinase A will be activated and it now can move around and phosphorylate a bunch of different substrate proteins and uh, trigger a series of uh, downstream signaling in once. So it's including almost everything like uh, direct cell proliferation, migration, differentiation, and sometimes can turn a normal cell into a tumor cell if there's too much like signaling transduced from PKA. All right, so after a certain amount of time, knowing that inside the cells, there's actually a switch, which is a kind of, uh, so it contains everything in a perfect balance. So after a certain amount of activation, CMP will dissociate with the uh, uh, regulatory domain of protein kinase A, and the uh, uh, protein kinase A will back into its inactive conformation. So any questions so far? Yes. Uh, like so, okay, the question is uh, what kind of proteins PKA actually phosphorylate? So that's actually a, a very good question, but uh, unfortunately I don't really know ex exact answers because there are so many proteins with a really big range of um, uh, proteins inside their cells can be phosphorylated by the protein kinase A. So what I was uh, talking about is that uh, the phosphorylation the process itself is a post-translational modification. Happens only on serine or serenine or tyrosine, those so uh, amino acid with a uh, hydroxyl side chain. So it's put an extra phosphor phosphate group to that hydroxyl group, uh, side chain and it will then uh, cause certain change Again, in uh, biological terms, it normally causes conformational change of the protein, causing its structure to be uh, altered slightly. And uh, this will change almost everything. And uh, either activate a protein or deactivate a protein. And uh, you know, this subsequently will lead to a lot of downstream consequences. And uh, it's not easy to predict, but uh, it just, you know, it's a divergent point of uh, cellular signaling. Okay, all right. Okay, that's, um, CAMP is uh, just the first uh, second messenger we're going to see today. There are many other second messengers. So in this case, we are looking at another two second messengers. One is uh, diacetyl glycerol, and the other is uh, inacetyl uh, four, five, uh, three, four, five, <coughs> sorry, one, four, five, triphosphate, or IP3. I hate the name, sorry for that. 
So uh, again, uh, these are two second messengers. We will see what the functionality of them later on. But uh, right now, we can just uh, discuss about how uh, the cells can get those, uh, where does the cell get those second messengers. Actually, it comes from a, a molecule named uh, pipe, pipe 2, so phosphoenositol-4,5-biphosphate. And uh, this is a component of your uh, plasma membrane. And uh, this thing can be actually digested by a kind of uh, uh, enzyme named uh, phospholipase uh, lipase C. And this can actually um, cut the inositol group out of uh, pipe 2 and forming the residue of the molecule is called the DAG. And what's been cut off is now formed as IP3. So these two things can function as uh, also both can function as second messengers. And now is uh, uh, we can say the function of those two secondary second messengers. So just uh, very similar to what we saw previously with the uh, PKA. So again, this time it's um, extracellular li ligand. It's uh, angiotensin two. Binding to G protein coupled receptor. Remember that uh, the waiters of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Now it's a different restaurant, obviously. So it's different G coupled receptor and G protein coupled receptor and a different G protein. And but the same similar things happens all the time. So after the angiotensin binds to the receptor, it triggers conformational change, causing Con subsequent conformation change of uh, G alpha subunit, and it's now will dissociate from beta and gamma subunits and bind to PLC. So PLC then is free to move on. I'm sorry, to digest pipe two from plasma membrane, and uh, then release two things. One is IP three, which later on binds to a receptor on your smooth ER. And the, the other is the DAG, like we discussed previously, it will remain on the plasma membrane. So the binding of IP3 to its receptor will trigger outflask uh, of um, calcium ion. So normally inside your cells, in your cytosol, the calcium concentration is around like 100 nanomolar. And uh, while in smooth ER, the concentration is uh, like 10,000, or at least several thousand times higher. So once the ion channel got opened by binding by IP3, calcium will flush uh, into, um, into the cytosol and trigger short-term contractility, which is, depends on really uh, complicated uh, biochemical reactions involved in uh, actin and myosin and a bunch of other proteins and which is also, the process also uh, ATP dependent. So we are not going to discuss in detail of this process, but you should be able to learn from here is that the binding of IP3 is critical to release calcium from smooth ER. And uh, again, that's another protein, just like protein kinase A is now protein kinase C. It will be bound by DAG and recruited to plasma membrane. And um, it only got activated when it also be bound by calcium. So now you have a PKC activated. It's just uh, doing similar things as PKA, but uh, phosphorylates different substrate, different population of, uh, down, uh, of other proteins. And it eventually will trigger activation of uh, in certain uh, plasma membrane ion channels, and ion pumps that uh, decrease the um, intracellular calcium concentration. And again, it will bring the system back to what its original was. And so uh, the system will be able, the cell will be able to respond to next round of stimuli. This is the really critical for your neuron cells because the, uh, the concentration difference, the gradient across the plasma membrane is everything that drives uh, neuron signal transduction. 
All right, so let's sum up the, this uh, uh, DHE IP3, the other two um, second messenger pathway. So again, just uh, like previously, what we saw is um, G protein coupled receptor receiving outside signal, which is um, in this case uh, angiotensin, which a uh, ligand of the receptor, and uh, it will activate G protein through conformational change. And the activated G protein will activate PLC, and PLC will digest uh, uh, PIP2 into two second messengers. And both the second messengers are required for activation of PKC, which in turn will, uh, activation of, uh, of the kinase will in turn bring uh, a divergence of um, downstream signal pathways. So, all right. After the activation of this, um, yeah. Yeah, the question is uh, if PKC is also kinase, and then the answer is yes. It's uh, just a, uh, it's a pretty uh, super family of uh, protein kinases, and uh, the PKC and the PKC gamma, delta, and there's many other isoforms of the protein, and they all do similar things to phosphorylate its substrate and causing post-translational modification on the protein and uh, kind of uh, impact its overall functionality. All right. Okay, so um, so what will uh, bring the end of this signal? So first is, uh, as we saw previously, calcium got to be pumped back to the ER, and we will explain this uh, mechanism later on, just uh, to the next in the next slide. And also for the DAG, it, it's gonna be digested just uh, like um, CMP, but it's through a different kinase, a different enzyme named uh, DAG kinase. It will uh, uh, digest uh, or actually uh, hydrolyze DAG into a um, uh, phospholipid precursor. So it can be recycled back to uh, the building block of your plasma membrane. Any questions so far for, uh, all right. So let's move on to what happens when cells want to remove those excessive intracellular calcium? So um, once there are too many calcium inside, so this is actually what happens in your neuron cells. That something will trigger opening of uh, ion channel on your neuron cells, plasma membrane, and the influx of uh, calcium will actually um, change, uh, trigger the um, impulse of a uh, neural signal. So what happens here to actually regulate the whole process is that a small molecule named, uh, actually it's a nitrogen monoxide, NO. It's uh, so small, so it can diffuse across plasma membrane freely. So it doesn't really need, a, like, uh, doesn't really need a receptor. It directly interact with the, uh, uh, actually, this just like you walking into the kitchen straight forward and tells the chef what you want to eat. So this is the um, uh, effect of protein in this pathway, the um, guanine cyclase. So just uh, similar to adenine cyclase, but uh, the substrate is different. So it actually covers GTP into CGMP, and which also kind of uh, required acquire the cofactor to uh, activate a protein kinase called PKG. And the PKG, once activated, I'm sorry, can phosphorylate the ion channel on the plasma membrane. So this can cause closure of the ion channel. So no more influx of calcium. And also it will phosphorylate a uh, calcium pump on smooth ER and which will pump in calcium at the cost of uh, hydrolyzed ATP. So by doing so, this will kind of bring the, um, the cytosolic calcium concentration back to the resting state. So in case if this is the neuron cell, the neuron cell will be back to its uh, resting state and will be ready for next round of stimuli. 
All right, so this sums up the, what happens for, uh, oh, let's just ask you a question. So how many second messengers you can actually find in this pathway? Anyone? So which are they? Yeah, I know that's a title, like three second messengers. <laughs> but which are these three messengers? Anyone get the answer? All right, so that's um, first messenger, of course, is um, nitrogen monoxide. It diffuses cross plasma membrane and activate uh, guanine cyclase. And the other is actually the product of uh, guanine cyclase, the CGMP. It's also a second messenger. And uh, the third one is actually what we saw previously. It's calcium. So that's three second messengers inside this single image. All right, this sums up the uh, nitrogen monoxide pathway. And uh, so it's a pretty similar, just uh, without the, yeah. So nitrogen uh, monoxide goes straight through the plasma membrane. Why is it considered a secondary messenger? Why is it a primary messenger? Uh, normally, because um, I believe so when it's considered a primary mes a messenger, it's kind of bind to something on the plasma membrane. And by binding to the, normally it's just a receptor. Bind to the receptor or bind to uh, ion channel, it will, um, kind of generate second messenger to inducing a uh, signal transduction cross plasma membrane. So what happens outside the, the bind, if the binding happens outside the, the cell is on the plasma membrane, then it's called primary messenger. And once it's already inside the cell, so it's kind of second messenger. So it's uh, not uh, like something directly interact with uh, a receptor on the plasma membrane, but it's interact with something inside of the cell. That makes sense? All right, no more questions. So uh, let's move on to sum up this uh, pathway. So just um, very similar because these are all G proteins. So they, do, they all do similar things, <coughs> although the details are different. So in this case, nitrogen monoxide uh, function as a second messenger. It's cross plasma memory, diffuse freely, and it activates guanine cyclase, producing another second messenger, CGMP, which activate protein kinase G, and uh, uh, we eventually will regulate the uh, intracellular calcium concentration in this case. And uh, also like CAMP, CGMP got eventually <coughs> degraded by a, also by a phosphodiesterase, this time uh, phosphodiesterase 5. So it's just a similar process, different names, but the principle behind everything is the same. It's flat. The, the flow of information from outside into inside, and uh, it will diverge into uh, different signal pathways. So, uh, all right, let's, any questions so far for any part of uh, g protein? Because we are kind of uh, reaching the, uh, the end of the whole signal pathway of g protein. Right. All right, so what this, to do with cholera. So let's go back to the first thing we learned on the first few slides. So this is the cartoon illustrating the, what actually your intestinal lumen. So this is the intestinal uh, epithelial cell. This is a lumen and this is a stroma. And what you can see is the g protein coupled receptor, g protein and uh, adenyl cyclase. So normally what would happen is that a protein called uh, VIP, it's a vessel active uh, like intestinal pipette. It, it will bind to G-protein coupled receptor and uh, like 
all <laughs> what we saw before in all G-protein coupled receptors. The binding of the extracellular ligand will trigger conformational change, eventually activate G alpha subunit, and which activate adenine cyclase chain uh, covered. It will cover ATP into CAMP and eventually activate PKA. Activated PKA will now phosphorylate, as we know, it phosphorylates substrate proteins. And uh, in this particular case, one of its substrate is called CFTR. Cyst, um, cyst fibrosis, uh, trans regulator, I think. Then the, this protein is actually a ion channel. It's a chloride channel. So once it's phosphorylated, it will open. Just unlike calcium, inside cells, um, the cells actually uh, has higher chloride concentration inside versus outside. So once the channel is open, the chloride will move you know, just following the concentration gradient, and it will move to the lumen, move out of, outside of the cell. And uh, by doing so, this will increase the osmosis pressure inside the lumen. And at the same time, higher osmosis pressure here will actually kind of suck water. The water molecule, it will dry water from Cross the uh, uh, epithelial barrier, so this water will get into the lumen. So this is normal. Uh, norm normally, what would happen, and uh, you know, after a certain amount of time, the PKA is going to be shut down because the CMP will be degraded, and uh, also, more importantly, the G alpha subunit it will hydrolyze the GTP it bound, and it will return into it it's inactive form, just like we saw before. It's a switch. Can, it should be able to be turned off. In case of cholera, because we know that uh, it's something caused by a toxin produced by the bacteria, cholera toxin. So this toxin kind of uh, ADP ribosylates the uh, G protein alpha subunits. And by doing so, it uh, actually prevent the alpha subunits to hydrolyze GTP. So instead of uh, to be able to be turned off, the G alpha subunits now kind of constitutively bound by uh, GTP and it will remain on like forever. So in this case, if you got the um, ADP ribosylated by uh, chlorotoxin, so G protein alpha subunit will be able to, uh, to activate adenine cyclase. And uh, it will cut huge amount of ATP into CAMP. And uh, they saturate the whole PKA system, uh, PKA system. And there will be no def uh, shutdown of this uh, signaling. And uh, you know, in the end, you have too much water inside your inter testing the lumen and uh, it's a diarrhea and it's uh, pretty bad. Eventually you will lose so much water in from your body and uh, it can kill you pretty quick. So again, how to treat the disease? Just stay hydrated, drink water. <coughs> so that's uh, actually a, a guidance from WHO about how to remain hydrated. It's just um, you know mix certain amount of uh, salt, you know, chloride and uh, sodium, and also some sugar, which is actually uh, uh, just glucose and fructose. So once you have this uh, mixture and with water, and you drink those um, solutions, the same would happen is if you study the uh, mini lecture in this uh, class, you will know that a uh, kind of uh, transport, transport on the membrane of the epithelial cells. It kind of bring in glucose together with sodium. And by doing so, it will also bring in together with the uh, chloride and reduce the, the osmosis pressure inside the uh, intestinal lumen. And it will kind of eliminate the 
the driving force that actually making you lose water from your body and you can become rehydrated and it solves all the problem. All right, so uh, that's pretty much all I have for today. So anyone have any questions? Yeah. So the question is uh, actually how does the chloride, why uh, outflux of chloride can actually cause losing of water. So if we go back to the diagram here is that you actually have blood vessels here at the stroma. So that's why the intestine of your, your body can absorb nutrition. And um, it's just not showing here, but uh, there are this area is kind of pretty hydrated. So there's plenty of uh, uh, blood vascular, uh, vascular system. And uh, the thing that uh, when you have a really, really high osmotic pressure here, it's just uh, like uh, when you uh, uh, say swimming inside the ocean. So the ocean is pretty acid, uh, like uh, it's the salt in the ocean will kind of suck water out of your body and you will feel like thirsty, right? So it's just a similar process. So when the, there's excessive iron here, iron needs more solvent, and which is water. So it will dry water from uh, where the concentration of iron is kind of lower into where concentration of iron is pretty higher. So that's why you lose water. So from the vascular system inside your uh, intestine, actually from your blood, into the intestine lumen and it's caused diarrhea. All right. I think we finish earlier. So if uh, no more questions, there are a few uh, excellent scholars, Dr. Gurent, which is expert in cholera, and uh, there are other two professors and um, Sotman and uh, new Dr. New Maker, and uh, they are also a uh, specialist in uh, G protein coupled receptor and uh, its mediated signaling. So, all right, if you uh, have any question, you can just uh, come to me after the class, and uh, if not, you you are free to go. And